Hello, it's Mrs. Delaney and welcome to the screencast on giant covalent bonding. We're going to start as we start every lesson with a retrieval practice. So you're going to need a piece of paper and a pencil to do this. We're going to build on what we've learned in the previous screencasts and we're going to draw some dot and cross diagrams. So I want you to read through the questions, pause the video, and then come back when you have drawn the dotted cross diagrams. Okay, let's self-assess our work now. Right, so the dot and cross diagram for hydrogen looks like that. Each of the hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. So the dot represents the electron from one of the hydrogens, say the one on the left, and the cross represents the electron in the outer shell of the hydrogen on the right and they both share one electron each so it's one covalent bond right hydrogen chloride so hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell and chlorine has seven so chlorine needs one more to fill its outer shell and hydrogen needs one more so you have got one covalent bond the chlorine if you go round you can count there are eight now in the outer shell and for the hydrogen you have two so both of them have got full outer shells right draw the dot and cross diagrams for the following hydrogen fluoride so it looks like that the same as it did for hydrogen chloride seven electrons from fluorine one electron hydrogen and they share one electron each a so one covalent bond h2o so oxygen has got six in its outer shell hydrogen have one each so in order for oxygen to get a full outer shell of eight it needs to share one electron with one hydrogen and another electron with another hydrogen and then oxygen has got eight in its outer shell if you count as you go around and each of the hydrogens has got two so two single covalent bonds h2o now oxygen as we just said has six in its outer shell so in order to get eight it needs to perform a double covalent bond with another oxygen so both of the oxygens need two more so therefore there are two dot cross dot cross that is a double covalent bond so hopefully you were successful with that if you weren't you need to go back to the covalent bonding screencast and have a little check to see if you can understand a bit better Okay, so the learning objective for today is to understand giant covalent bonding. And there are four success criteria. So we're going to be able to give examples of giant covalent substances. We're going to be able to describe the properties of giant covalent substances. We're going to specifically explain the properties of diamond and graphite, and then be able to link the properties of diamond and graphite to their structure. Okay, so in order to understand giant covalent bonding, we need to look at these key words. Delocalized electrons, which we met in metallic bonding, and giant covalent bonding, which is something, when you're talking about giant, you're talking about many, many, many atoms all joined together, not just a few. OK, so if you want to look more closely at these keywords, pause the video now and come back when you've done that. OK, so what are the names of the substances below? So write down what's the name of picture one? What is the substance in picture two? And what is the substance in picture three? Okay, picture one is called sand. 
and the chemical name for sand is silicon dioxide. Picture two is called graphite. So we have graphite in our pencils. And picture three is probably quite easy, is diamond. Now, I wonder if you can tell me what element makes up number two and number three. Yes, carbon. So both of them are made of carbon. Okay, so in some substances, such as silicon dioxide or silica, in diamond and in graphite, millions of atoms are joined together by covalent bonds. The covalent bonds in these substances do not form molecules, which are small and just a few atoms, but vast networks of atoms called giant covalent structures. So we met a giant structure when we were doing ionic bonding, and that was a giant ionic lattice. We met a giant structure when we were talking about metals, right? And this is a third one. Now, if we can think back to the properties of the giant ionic lattice and the giant metallic substance, then you might be able to predict some of the properties of these giant substances. So all the bonds are covalent bonds. And there are a vast number of bonds to break. Meaning, just like with the metals and with the ionic lattice, you're going to need a lot of energy to break them all. So for that reason, giant covalent structures have very high melting and boiling points and are very hard. So just like ionic substances were hard and metals are hard, right? Just like they have a lot of bonds to be broken, these have a lot of bonds to be broken and they need a lot of energy, which means it's a very high melting and boiling point. Okay, so that is some examples of giant covalent substances, graphite, diamond, and silicon dioxide. Okay, so use your previous notes and what you've seen today to summarize the basic properties of simple molecular structures and giant covalent structures. What I want you to do is draw yourself a table and sketch in where, whether you think that the melting point is low or high, the boiling point is, is low or high, and whether it's hard or not hard. In addition to that, I'd like you to name three simple covalent substances and three giant covalent substances. So pause the video now and come back when you've answered the questions. Okay, right, hopefully you filled your table in now. Right, so simple molecular substances have low melting points and giant covalent have high or very high. Simple molecular have low boiling points and giant covalent have high boiling points. Simple molecular, obviously, because most of them are gases, are not hard whereas giant covalent are very hard. Now you could give an awful lot of examples of simple covalent substances, so I'm sure that you're gonna be correct, but the ones I've written down are hydrogen, chlorine, water, carbon dioxide. There are many, many other ones, right? Giant covalent, there are fewer, so, just the ones that we have mentioned, diamond, graphite, and sand, which is silicon dioxide. So hopefully you've been successful with that. Okay, so we're gonna look more closely at graphite and diamond. They're both giant covalent substances and they both have very high melting and boiling points, but they do have also very different properties. Right, diamond has 
all four electrons in the outer shell of carbon, remember carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, well, all of them are involved in making another bond with another carbon, okay? So every single electron makes a covalent bond with another carbon atom, okay? So because all the bonds are made, diamond is extremely hard. And in fact, it's the hardest natural substance we know. Because all of those bonds are made, it has a very high melting and boiling point. And diamond, because there are no charged particles present, no ions, no electrons free to move, it cannot conduct electricity. So I want you to pause the video now. I want you to complete the covalent bonding diagram to show how carbon atom bonds with four other carbon atoms. As well as that, I'd like you to explain why diamond is used to edge drilling tools. So pause the video now and come back when you've answered the questions. Okay, so hopefully you've done that now. So the covalent bonding in that diagram, remembering that carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, right? So you're going to form four covalent bonds like that. Now, what we haven't shown are the other three electrons on each of W, X, Y, and Z. Those three would then go on and form covalent bonds with three other carbon atoms. Okay, but we haven't got enough room to do that. But that shows you how all of the electrons are involved in the covalent bonds. Right, why is diamond used to edge drilling tools? Diamond is very hard due to the strong covalent bonds between the carbon atoms. So that means that a large force is needed to break the bonds. And there are an awful lot of bonds in diamond because it's a giant substance. Okay, looking at graphite now, graphite is still made of carbon. And remember the carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, but only three of the four electrons are involved in covalent bonding. So if you look at this carbon here, we've got one bond there, one bond there, and one bond there. But the fourth one, is left over and there's no bond downwards, okay? So you can see what we've got here are lots of layers, okay? And we've got a free electron, which we call a delocalized electron, which we met in metallic bonding, okay? So graphite is soft and slippery. Graphite will conduct electricity. Graphite has a high melting and boiling point, but not as high as diamond. Okay, so what I want us to do now is draw another table. And we're going to summarize what we've learned about diamond and graphite. Okay, so sketch yourself this table, pause the video and fill it in and come back when you've done it. Okay. Let's self-assess our work. Right, so the number of covalent bonds in diamond is four and the number in graphite is three. Diamond has a very high melting and boiling point. Graphite has a high melting and boiling point. Diamond is very hard and graphite is not very hard. It's quite brittle because of the layers. Diamond cannot conduct electricity, but graphite can. So hopefully you were successful with that. Okay, so we can now describe the properties of some of the giant covalent substances. What we want to do now is try and explain them based upon their physical properties. Okay, so in diamond, all four electrons in the outer shell 
are involved in the covalent bonding and that affects the properties of diamond. Right, because it's hard, we have got strong covalent bonds between all of the carbon atoms, all of them. And that means a very, very large forces need to break the bonds because not only have you got millions and millions of carbon atoms, but the covalent bonds are strong. So you are breaking millions and millions of those bonds. Diamond has a very high melting and boiling point. So you're going to need a lot of energy to break all those covalent bonds. Diamond cannot conduct electricity. And the reason for that is it doesn't have any charged particles. There are no delocalized electrons. So there's nothing to actually carry a charge through it. Right, in graphite, only three of the four electrons in the outer shell of each carbon atom are involved, only three. And the other one leaves a delocalized electron. So graphite is soft and slippery. That was the property. The reason it's soft and slippery is because it has lots of layers. And those layers, as you can see, they can slide over each other. So therefore, it, there's a weak force of attraction between the layers and you can easily slide them over each other. And that's why graphite's used as a lubricant. Graphite conducts electricity. And it's the only non-metal that's able to do that. The free electron, the delocalized electron, that is able to move in between the layers and carry charge throughout. It's got a high melting and boiling point because between the layers of carbon, there's a weak intermolecular force. The layers are able to slide over each other, but also you would have to break all of those covalent bonds in order to melt it. And that means you need a lot of energy. Okay, so checkpoint three, part one, we're going to look at the properties of diamond. So sketch another table, pause the video, and then come back when you've done it. Okay, so let's self-assess our answers. Okay, so the reason why diamond is very hard is because it has strong covalent bonds between the carbon atoms. And because there's so many of those bonds, a large force is needed to break all the bonds. It has a very high melting and boiling point because a lot of energy is needed to help break those strong covalent bonds. It does not conduct electricity because there are no delocalized electrons and there are no other charged particles to carry a charge. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing with graphite. So pause the video now, sketch your table and come back when you've answered the question. Okay, hopefully you've done it now. Let's self-assess. Right, so graphite is brittle because it has strong bonds between the carbon atoms in each layer, but there are weak intermolecular forces between the layers and they can be easily broken. It's soft and slippery because the layers can easily slide over each other because of those weak forces of attraction between the layers. And it conducts electricity because it has got a free electron from the electron that isn't involved in the covalent bonding. And where you have a charged particle, it's able to move in between the layers and it's able to carry a charge. So that means it conducts electricity. So that's our third success criteria. We need to look at the last one to be able to link the properties of diamond and graphite to their structure. Okay, so here's the first part. I want you to pause the video and just write down true or false for each of these statements. Okay, 
Welcome back. Let's self-assess. So the bonding in diamond and graphite is simple covalent bonding. That's false. It's giant covalent. In graphite, there are four covalent bonds. That also is false. There's only three. In diamond, there are four covalent bonds. That is true. Both diamond and graphite conduct electricity. That is false because only graphite conducts electricity. Diamond does not. Both diamond and graphite have high melting points due to the large number of strong covalent bonds. That is true. Both diamond and graphite have delocalized electrons. That is false because diamond doesn't have any delocalized electrons because all of the electrons are involved in the covalent bonds. Okay, so the second part of our checkpoint, I want you to answer the questions and come back when you've answered them and we'll self-assess it. Okay, welcome back. Let's self-assess it. Right, explain why graphite can conduct electricity. Graphite can conduct electricity due to the one delocalized electron for every carbon atom. These electrons can move and carry charge through the whole structure. Explain why graphite is used as a lubricating material. Between the layers of carbon atoms, there are weak intermolecular forces. So therefore, the layers are able to slide over each other easily. And that's what you need for a good lubricant. Graphite is softer than diamond. Explain why. In graphite, between the layers of the carbon atoms, there are weak intermolecular forces and the layers are able to slide over each other easily. Whereas in diamond, each carbon atom has four strong covalent bonds with the other carbon atoms, meaning that the carbon atoms cannot slide and diamond is rigid and hard. Explain why graphite would not be suitable for making the touch screen for a phone. Graphite is opaque. That means you can't see through it. And the layers of carbon atoms can slide over each other. So the screen would wear away and it wouldn't be transparent. OK, so that is our last success criteria. Hopefully you have a better understanding of giant covalent bonding. Thank you for joining me for this screencast.